interesting talk. Actually, I didn't understand the answer to the fundamental uh, Hillel. I didn't understand the question, the answer to the fundamental question. Now I'm sitting here and there is an earthquake. I saw these people are sitting. What, I say, what are we supposed to do? Remain when things are falling or escape? No answer. It's not easy. I mean, the floods. Uh, I saw. You avoid the floods, but uh, I see. Okay, so we don't know what to do. Uh, Okay, next, uh, uh, Professor Noga Kornfeld, and she's, going, she's uh, the chair of the School of Zoology in Tel Aviv University, and she's going to talk about life under extreme conditions. Noga, please. Um, thank you. I'm really excited to give uh, this talk to such an audience. Uh, thank you, Mira, for inviting me. Um, I see myself as a basic scientist, not, uh, uh, not looking or not driven by uh, um, a translational research. And I hope I changed my talk because I hope that uh, I will convince you that doing basic research is uh, as important as doing uh, translational research. Um, so I'll start it uh, with, uh, with my own story. I did my, PhD, my master's work at uh, Tel Aviv University. Professor Amir Amskolnik. I worked with uh, Professor Amir Amskolnik. I did my master's on adaptation. I'm trying to tell you. But during my, my studies, I read one of uh, Amir Am's uh, papers. Uh, on, on these golden spiny mice, which are desert rodents that live in rocky deserts in Israel, Egypt, Jordan. Um, and Amiram was asking, how come such a small mammal thrives in, in a desert condition with no running water and it's day active when temperatures are 45 degrees Celsius during the day and it's, it still survives. And the story Amiram told me was that uh, it, it, it used to be very difficult to get here to Engedi, and he was carrying lots of uh, boxes with uh, traps to trap these animals. And unfortunately, there was another species sharing the same habitat, and this is the common spiny mouse. The common spiny mouse is, is nocturnal, it's night active, and as its name implies, it's much more common. So Amiram kept putting traps, working very hard, and trapping more common spiny mice than golden spiny mice. So he had a good idea, and he decided that every time he's going to trap a, a common spiny mice, he will take the trap, drive 10 kilometers away, release the mouse back there, and then every time he puts the traps in the field, he will get only com golden spiny mice, and he did that. But to his surprise, the golden spiny mice turned nocturnal. So he, he was asking a, questions about the, the, a question about diurnality, and now he was trapping the mice very easily, but they were nocturnal, nocturnally active. And Amiram suggested that the golden spiny mouse is forced into the urinal activity by its somewhat more vigorous congener. And he published it in a small journal, Journal of Biometeorology, and didn't do anything about it. And back then they didn't know much about circadian rhythms, but when I read this paper, I thought this is amazing. They're just like human shift workers. Some external condition is making them shift their activity from the preferred niche or the preferred activity pattern, which is nocturnal, to a diurnal one. That's, uh, that's amazing. And I started, uh, first I, I, I must say I didn't believe this uh, observation because he was all, uh, only doing it using traps. And then I thought that if this is true, that it's going to be a great PhD project. So I went to Amiram and I told him this is going to be my PhD. And this is what I did. And the first thing I did was repeat his experiments in a controlled way using advanced techniques with the body temperature and activity transmitters, with the data loggers, and I built these four large enclosures, each 20 by 50 meters. You can see them during breakfast from the window. Um, and in this way, I could control how many mice I have in each enclosure and monitor them continuously over a, a long time, like even years. 
Um, and I use the artificial food patches, which you can see here. This is an antenna. Each mouse had, uh, had a RFID implanted, so I could tell which animal went onto the antennas and ate in these food patches. And in the food patches, I mixed a known amount of sed and seeds. And using modeling and, and diminishing returns uh, uh, models, I could calculate how much food they could eat during the day and during the night. And I, I really have a lot of information. I'm still using this system. And I use it for different uh, uh, questions. Uh, one of the questions we're dealing with now is, is uh, light pollution. And we are asking questions about what uh, spectrum uh, intensity and timing of how different spectrum intensity and timing of light affects nocturnal and diurnal rodents. But it's, this is not a story I want to tell you today. And going back to, uh, to the, the, the main question, what we found was that, as Amiram said, when the animals are uh, in their natural habitat, the golden spiny mice here in black dots are active during the day and rest during the night, and it's the opposite for the common spiny mice, so they share the habitat. And if I take the animals, both species, either separate them or take them to the, to the lab at Tel Aviv University, what I find is that the common spiny mice are still nocturnal, as they are in the field, and this is an actogram depicting 24 hours, and the days are plotted one below the other. So this is 15 or 17 days. This is the daytime and nighttime, one day below the other. And you can see that most of the activity is concentrated during the night. But if I look at the golden spiny mice, in the field, as I, oh, in the field, as I said, they're daily, day active. This is, again, an actogram, 48 hours this time. They're active during the, the day. Their body temperature is high during the night. But if I separate them from the, the common spiny from the common spiny mice, or if I bring them to the lab, they immediately shift their activity. And you can see the shift very clearly here. On one day, on the same day, within an hour, they shift their activity to nocturnal activity, which means that they are active against their native clock during all their lives, which is amazing. Um, so I wanted to see if this shift is only at the behavioral level or also at, at the uh, molecular level. So I, I started growing uh, golden spiny mice in the lab. And fortunately, they switch their activity also when I keep them at Tel Aviv University indoors and outdoors. And the shift occurs also at the molecular level. So here you can see the SCN, the results for the SCN in golden spiny mice kept outdoors when they're diurnal in, in yellow and indoors when they're nocturnal in, in gray. And these are the results of different clock gene expression levels. Um, the SCN is a, the central clock. And you can see that the central clock, we find exactly the same pattern. It doesn't matter. The clock says the same, gives the same time. But if you look at peripheral uh, 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 clock rhythms, you can see that, for example, in the lung, there is a shift. And they shift between nocturnal and uh, diurnal pattern. So the next question I asked was, is this typical to diurnal species, or is this a, a special case? And I was really surprised to find out that there is no uh, information about what is going on in the, in the circadian clock and in peripheral rhythms in diurnal species, which is amazing because we are diurnal, but we work on uh, nocturnal mice and rats. So I thought, okay, I should find a good example of a, of a diurnal species and fill up this gap. So I decided to work on, a, on the fat sandrat, another diurnal rodent that we can find in Israel. And we brought them to the lab. And surprisingly, they also shifted. So maybe this is not such an unusual uh, situation. So I started looking for diurnal rodents around the world. And I wrote to everyone I knew that had access to diurnal rodents, asking them, what is the rhythm of the, these diurnal rodents when you bring them to the lab? And all of them, except squirrels, switch. We couldn't find one single diurnal rodent species that stays diurnal under laboratory conditions, which is amazing. So I started thinking about the evolution of diurnality. And 
if you look at, uh, I started collecting information about activity patterns of different rodents, and what I found was that the ancestral state of, of all mammals, actually, and also all rodents, is nocturnal. And diurnality, marked here in, in orange, actually occurred in relatively late stages of evolution and in many different unrelated occasions from different reasons. So you can see here on the family level that it occurred at least, at least se minimum seven times in, in rodents. So it's expected that diurnality will not be as rigid as nocturnality and also it's expected that it will be much more diverse. So what do we know about the mechanism controlling activity patterns? We know that it's controlled by the SCN, the major, uh, the, the, the main uh, clock in the brain, in the hypothalamus. And we know that there are many different mechanisms that enhance the rhythm. For example, uh, there are daily rhythms in anxiety which confine activity to the correct part of the dial cycle. We know that uh, when we eat, when uh, we, are, we are active, it synchronizes uh, the, the clocks in peripheral organs, and all this enhances the activity pattern. But is this true to, for, for diurnal rodents? It's not. So when, when I, and, and again, there was no information in the literature, and I started working on different rodents, and what I found was that if you look at anxiety level, in, in nocturnal mammals we, found, we find a really nice rhythm, but in diurnal ones, in some of them we find the rhythm, in some we don't find the rhythm at all, in some of them the rhythm is very weak. We see that uh, uh, the masking effect of flight or other, other mechanisms are not operating as, as clearly as uh, rhythms in nocturnal species. And it's interesting that the, when we looked at SCN electrical activity, the main clock, we looked at FOS expression, we looked at to the G uptake, we looked at uh, gene ex clock gene expression, it's the same in nocturnal and diurnal species and it's always high during the day and low during the night. Moreover, if you look at melatonin expression, it's always secreted during the night, both in diurnal and in nocturnal species, which means that melatonin is producing the opposite information. It means it's night. Night for nocturnal species means you have to wake up and be active. When we take mel melatonin, we go to sleep. It lowers our body temperature. So something is completely wrong here. So I started thinking about biomedical studies. <laughs> so humans are diurnal and mice are not. And nevertheless, most of the biomedical studies are conducted using nocturnal mice and rats without accounting for it. We don't know what the difference is. And if we don't know what the difference is, we can't account for it. And this is especially true when we talk about uh, circadian uh, uh, diseases that are related to circadian rhythms. And it's important to note that nocturnality is not just a mirror image of diurnality as we found. So one of the consequences of all these changes would be a lower robustness or a lower amplitude of the circadian rhythms. And we already know that a low, a reduced amplitude is uh, associated with a number of diseases, including meta metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and depression. And, we also, and, and it could also explain why diurnal rodents lose their rhythm or switch their rhythm when we take them to the lab. So I thought, okay, let's try and see uh, if I can induce these diseases easily in diurnal rodents. So I started thinking about, the, the first thing I thought about was depression. And I thought, okay, but I have to induce depression in some way. So the, 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 the disease that is most clearly related to circadian system is seasonal affective disorder. So, and, and I looked in the literature for a good model for seasonal affective disorder and I couldn't find any. And it makes sense because if you take a nocturnal rodent, which during the day is in its burrow and is not exposed to light, and during the night it's active and it's not exposed to light, and you keep it in the, in, under laboratory conditions and you force it to be exposed for, to light for 12 hours because we keep our animals at 12, 12 light dark cycle and they don't have a shelter, so they're exposed to light. So if you reduce the photo period, you're actually making their situation better, not worse. So it makes sense that they won't show seasonal affective disorder. So I did a very simple, I approached a, a psychopharmacologist and we did a very simple experiment. 
keeping uh, uh, diurnal animals under short photo period. And luckily, we have a zoological garden at Tel Aviv University where we keep a diverse number of diurnal rodents. So I could easily do, this, do it. And these are the species that we worked on over the years. And all we did was keep the animals for three weeks, either under 12-12 light dark cycle or under short photo period. And indeed, we could easily induce uh, depressive-like behavior and high anxiety levels. We could treat these animals with uh, uh, antidepressants like imipramine and bopropion. But more surprisingly, we were able to treat them with bright light treatment, which means giving them one hour of full spectrum light for one hour during the photo period. So we were not extending the photo period. We were giving them the, the high spectrum, high, high uh, intensity light for one hour. And this is the first animal models, these are the first animal models that respond to light treatment. It used to be considered as placebo. And it, why? Because when you give a nocturnal animal a light pulse, it's anoxious. It responds negatively. And if you want to do an experiment with humans, they know if you turned on a 10,000 lux light or not. So they know if they are in the control or the experimental group. And, uh, and you can't really co uh, conduct controlled experiments. So this was uh, uh, very exciting. And we, could also, we also found that uh, this was accompanied by changes uh, at the molecular level. For example, in, in the uh, BDNF mRNA expression, uh, levels in the frontal cortex, which is also described in depressed patients, reduced the uh, 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 amplitude of the activity level of body temperature and many other, many other things. So most of the experiments we did with the, the fat sand rats from different reasons. And uh, oh, I just wanted to say that all the animals that, uh, again, we, I worked with many other labs around the world, and all the animals that switch their activity also show uh, depressive and anxiety-like behavior when we keep them under short uh, photo period. We still didn't do it with Tukotoko. It's in South America, and it's a bit dif difficult uh, to do it, but I hope that we will uh, do it. And, and there's another species that we work on now in China. Um, so one of the things that bothered me when I was working with the fat sand rats is that they are a very well-known model for type 2 diabetes. And, if, uh, and, and the story is that uh, these animals eat salt bush. See it here in, in the picture. It's a desert shrub, very low in carbohydrate uh, content, very high salt content and very low energy content. And when you bring it to the lab uh, it, uh, and give it a normal rodent chow, it develops type 2 uh, diabetes within about six months. So to do all these experiments, I had to buy them a, 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 a special diet, which was very expensive. And it bothered me. And one day, I was filling up a, 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 an order form, and I thought, well, depression is also associated with circadian rhythms. And another change that happens when we take these animals from the field to the lab is that they shift their activity. They lose their rhythmicity. So maybe that's why they develop diabetes and not because of the food. But if this is true, then all the species that I had in my list were supposed to develop diabetes irrespectively of their diet. So I stopped writing the order for a minute and I started the literature search and, and amazingly, all of them do. All of them develop type 2 diabetes. Some of them are insectivorous, some of them are granivorous, some of them eat bulbs, and they all do. So I had the green light uh, to start and conduct experiments. And what I'm telling you now is still unpublished. I hope to publish it really soon. It's all done. Um, and um, again, we did ver a very simple experiment, keeping the animals under a short photo period or long photo period with normal rodent chow or low fat diet, low energy diet. And our hypothesis was that instead of developing 
uh, type 2 diabetes within six months, they will develop it much faster because under short photo period, their rhythms are blunted and, and, and uh, if, if the, the change in rhythmicity is causing the, the, the development of type 2 diabetes, it means that it will develop much faster. And indeed it did. And you can see here the results. This is a, 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 a glucose tolerance test. The, the, the gray bars are the animals under short photo period. Uh, the yellow ones are long photo period. Uh, and the colors depict the different diets. Red is the normal Rodenchow and green is the low energy diet. And you can clearly see there's no need for statistics. That after, now it, it, we now have results showing, this is after two months, but now we have results after six weeks under these conditions. They develop type 2 diabetes. Their insulin levels are extremely high. They, show, they develop cataract, uh, high systolic blood pressure. Everything is there. And what we're trying to do now, and I actually have results, but uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I won't show them uh, today. I hope they will be published within a month or two. As we are trying to take these short photo period animals and increase their circadian rhythms, the amplitude of their circadian rhythms using different means and see if this prevents the development of type two diabetes. And I can tell you that it does. So it's not the diet, it's the circadian rhythms and uh, timing. Um, and these animals also show the si signs of uh, seasonal affective disorder, as, uh, as you can see here in the anxiety test and uh, despair test. So if you look, I, I call it 3D. If you look at, 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 at all these species, you see that all the diurnal species develop depression and diabetes when kept under actually more modernized conditions. This is how we live. We live in a similar conditions to these animals. The only cycling environmental condition is really light and dark, and this is not enough. And what we think is that this is contributing to the development of type 2 diabetes. And we also have a hypothesis regarding the mechanism. So if the ancestral state was nocturnal, and as I showed you, there are different mechanisms to enhance the amplitude of this rhythm. In order to switch to diurnality, the animals had to first lose all these mechanisms that enhance the rhythm, and only then switch to the urinal activity. And what I think is that under natural conditions, there are many cycling variables which synchronize peripheral rhythms and, and, and take over the SCN, which, keeps, which, which stays, fun, keep functioning as a time teller, but doesn't control the activity pattern. And when we bring them to the lab, there are no other environmental conditions that cycle, the peripheral rhythms are, uh, are, are not influencing activity pattern. The SCN takes over, but because there aren't any other mechanism to enhance the rhythm, we get a shallow nocturnal rhythm in the lab. And this causes uh, this reduced robustness of the circadian system, increase their, the susceptibility of diurnal species to, to uh, diabetes and depression. So my take home message is that uh, understanding how the circadian system of the urinal mammals work is crucial for understanding of our own circadian system. And I think that studying the urinal animals will open new horizons for uh, the research and prevention of uh, circadian rhythms uh, related diseases like depression and diabetes and the development of new treatment approaches at, uh, aimed at uh, alleviating symptoms and improving the quality of life. And I just want to say that one of the difficulties uh, of using diurnal animals is that animal houses in universities can't keep diurnal species. And the only reason we can do it is that we have a zoological garden, but most of the, most of the, of the facilities are SPF and the, the students that work there can't even keep rodents in their house as pets. 
so I think it, it demands a whole paradigm shift uh, and we have to start working on uh, Diana Rodents or at least ask questions about the consequences of using nocturnal mammals as a main uh, model for diurnal uh, uh, humans. And I just want to thank my uh, collaborators from around the world and the PhD, I didn't put all the students, the PhD students that contributed to the work that I, I showed and the funding agencies and thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you. So uh, first, we collected the uh, feces of all these animals from uh, the experiments that we conducted. Uh, we just need the money to analyze the microbiome, and we don't have it. Um, the second question, and I must say that I, I, I think the microbiome is really important, but I think it's a fashionable issue, and the people give it much more uh, importance than they should. I, I, I'm not saying it's not important, I'm just saying that we need to keep things uh, in proportion. No, I agree, I, I agree. I'm not saying it's not important and that's why we collected the feces and we have them stored in minus 80 if you want to analyze them. Uh, um, but I think, I, I'm not sure that this is the important uh, issue. It could be one of the mechanisms. Uh, and for the second question, I, uh, it, it, I think that uh, exposing people to light, especially in the morning, uh, and uh, exposing them to light during the day, so you, you don't know if it's night or day now. You have no idea because we are under artificial light. And, and, uh, and it's not only that you don't know, the circadian system is actually the difference between day and night is reduced. So we, we don't really, even, even with light, food is available all the time, uh, temperature is controlled, uh, there's no, uh, there's hardly a difference. The only difference we see is between day and night, and even this is really small because we use light during the night. Even if we don't turn on the light in our houses, all the cities have outdoor light and it goes through our, our windows. And we have blue light from the telephones and from the screens and we're exposed to light during the night, which was never the case during evolution. Think about what happened during the, the, the evolution of life on Earth for like billions of years. Light was the most uh, reliable cue for day and night and for season. And, it's, and, and all, all organisms have biological clock, which is tuned by light. And during... We, we actually made a huge difference. So, so people started using light as a, with fire and candles and then gas, but then it was really more reddish light, which is less, uh, less uh, inf inf influencing the circadian rhythm less. And also it was very restricted because it was uh, expensive and manual. But now with lead light, which is very uh, cheap, and you can use solar panels, and you can uh, and you can have automatic uh, uh, systems municipally that turn on and off the light, and they really like to make everything clear and bright because we are diurnal; we are used to be active during daytime. So we're trying to s turn the night into day. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, first, as a preventive measure, if we if we design the light that we are exposed to in a better way, that, that could help. Uh, we actually did experiments, I didn't show them to you, uh, where we took 
animals that were already sick, like after six months or so, they already showed wounds and, and cataract and everything. And we started treating them with bright light and they improved. They didn't heal, but so cataract stayed, the wounds were healed and their, their, their uh, insulin levels and, uh, and the, the glucose tolerance improved, but it depends at what stage. So if you go to a later stage, nothing helps, but after about six months, we could, we could help them just by exposing them to light. So I, I think it will, it, it, it may be useful. I mean, I think it's, and I actually think you, you, you get, uh, there was a talk on, on, uh, on, on diabetes on the first day showing that uh, patients that uh, were here and uh, Beth in the Dead Sea had better uh, reduced uh, fasting glucose levels and I'm, I'm not sure that it's not because of the fact that they were exposed to light. Yeah. I mean, so it's not that there's, I mean, the curiosity about your rodents is that they're shifting diurnal nocturnal. Right. This isn't happening to humans to keep a circadian clock is still running. I mean, so. I agree. No, no, no. At the beginning of your talk, that rodents and humans are a bad model. But now you're using rodents to model our diabetic problem. I mean, there's loads of physiological data. I, I agree. About fatty livers and so, uh, I, so I have several questions. First, if you put these animals in, in continuous dark conditions, like in the caves, they show a free running rhythm, but it starts from a nocturnal phase. Second, humans and actually all primates uh, switched to diurnality much earlier, but they also went through this shift. So I'm not saying that uh, diurnal rodents are a better uh, model. I'm just saying that we have to understand how come melatonin, for example, is translated in the opposite way in humans and in, in, in mice and rats? And until we don't know what the mechanism is, how come it happens, diurnal rodents will be a better model than nocturnal rodents. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that we should skip working with mice and rats altogether because they're a wonderful model and I think that most labs should work on, on an animal that we already have so much information and we can use advanced tools. I, I, I must say that when I want to do even an insulin test, I have to validate it first. So I do a lot of work that people that work on mice and rats don't have to do. It's much more difficult to work on a non-model organism, but I think we have to do it. I'm not saying, no, I, I agree, but I, I, so, so I, I just think that this is another thing that we have to take into account. And, I, and another thing I want to say is that uh, even in mice, uh, when you give them a high fat diet uh, and they gain weight and become diabetic, uh, there was a paper published in uh, Cell by Sanchi Panda last year, and he showed that if he gives these animals high fat diet, these mice, C57 black mice, high fat diet only during the night and he removes it during the day. They eat the same amount of calories, but they don't get diabetic. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I'll be happy to talk with you about it later. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, and I actually did a sabbatical in Alaska. <laughs> 
to look at this. Um, and uh, first, they show much higher uh, prevalence of uh, depression. Uh, and they are very much aware, and, and also obesity, uh, I, 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 and, and they are very much aware about light exposure. So when you rent an apartment, for example, in Alaska, one of the things, I, I rented it in, in summer because I went there during the summer, and one of the things that they advertise is that they have uh, opaque shields. So they will have uh, night, uh, dark, dark conditions at night. So they're v and, and they sell in the supermarket full spectrum lights. To be, so, so people will expose themselves to full spectrum lights during the day. But I must say that evolutionarily, people didn't live in, the, in uh, were not adapted to live in, in these conditions. You gave a great example, first of all, of super disciplinarity. <laughs> shocked that melatonin can have two different results between diurnal and nocturnal animals because in plants, which also have, we have uh, diurnal and nocturnal plants, the same signaling molecule, phytochrome, can either activate or inhibit. And so the fact that the system itself can have the same components shouldn't be surprising. It's what's downstream, which is going to give the yeah. Yeah, and this is what we don't know. And I think that what's surprising is not that it's opposite. It should have been obvious. But, but, but the surprising thing is that no one is asking this question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. So we tried everything we could think of, and we can't make them diurnal in the lab because this would be the perfect setup if I could just have a control and experimental animal. But the amazing thing is that I, I, even if I keep them with the windows open, they switch to nocturnality, but if I take the same cage with the same monitoring system and I move it outdoors in Tel Aviv, they switch. I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.